Now, Neil, you make it sound like at age nine, you had this vision of yourself as an astrophysicist, and you sort of marched very steadily towards that goal. But there must have been some time. Tell me about the time, the, the toughest time you had on this pathway when you almost did, went and did something else. And, and, and what, what kept you on track? Well, uh, I, well, I still can't say that I almost did something else. You know, astrophysics is not the first subject you think of to put food on somebody's plate or to somehow improve the situation of the underprivileged in the world. It's just not the first profession that you think of. Um, so my parents, who were, my father was active in the civil rights movement. Uh, my mother was a housewife at the time, a very uh, common profession of the day. And later on, went back to school, became a gerontologist. So here are my, my parents who are helping people. And here's their son, you know, studying black holes, right? Look it up at the sky. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a little weird. It's a little weird, but they were supportive of this. And all right. But I still had some discomfort about whether I was doing the right thing culturally. Mm -hmm. I knew I was doing the right thing personally, but you want to make a difference in the world. If, if, if you don't want to make a difference in the world, go move to another planet. I mean, why, what are you here for? You know, why? Just don't move to Pluto. <laughs> right. That, that wouldn't count. But. And so, meanwhile, all right, I, I go to high school and I take extra science classes and extra math classes and you know, advanced calculus and all this stuff. And I go to college. And I was athletic in high school and college. I wrestled, by the way. Uh, I, I wrestled in the weight category at the time, uh, 190 pounds, 190. Now, that's a key weight category of all of them. There are 10 weight categories. Why? Because if you show up 192 pounds, you then get classified in a weight category called unlimited, OK? <laughs> so there's really good incentive to hit that weight. <laughs> so there was another guy on the team who was my weight. We were the same weight. He was a senior, talented fellow, majoring in economics. In fact, he became a Rhodes Scholar during the year. And we'd, go, we'd come in, I had a nice, good workout. We're coming out, and he said, you know, how's, how's it going? I'm a freshman. How's, how's it going? I said, oh, all my problem sets are kicking my butt. I barely have time to go to the bathroom. And he said, well, what was it you're majoring in again? I said, well, physics. And he says, well, and you want to do what? With I said, I want to uh, get a PhD in astrophysics. And you know what he said to me? By the way, what was he going to do with his Rhodes Fellowship at Oxford? He was going to explore the role of enterprise zones in inner city neighborhoods to empower those who are economically disenfranchised. Okay. He's black, by the way. So he turns to me and said, astrophysics. The, then he says the following, the black community cannot afford the luxury of someone with your intellect to spend it on that subject. And I was devastated yeah. by that comment. Devastated. Now, he wasn't just anybody saying it. This is somebody who was walking the walk and talking the talk. And so I had no way out of that. He dug a hole and put me in the hole. And I, and, and I had no shovel, I mean, no ladder, no way to, and there I was in a hole, trying to think my way out of it. And I knew my interest in the universe was real because I felt it in my heart. I felt it coursing through my veins. But my responsibility as an educated member of society was eating away at that ambition. In the absence of another way to think about the problem, I just kept at it, but with this albatross around my neck, this, this guilt that maybe I wasn't doing all I could to help others. All right. It's 1989. I'm in graduate school in New York City, Columbia University, Upper West Side. A phone call comes into the department from Fox News. This is before Fox was a national 
network. It was just local Fox News. The weather guy had read over the newswire that there was an explosion on the sun. Okay. A blob of plasma, plasma, astrophysical plasma, which is just a gas with a lot of ionized particles in it. So it actually responds to magnetic fields. It's kind of a, kind of a cool state, of, sometimes called the fourth state of matter. And the guy said, you know, I get, there's this explosion on the sun. What could you tell us about it? I said, oh, it's just a blob of plasma, highly a ch a charged particles moving fast. About 100 times the size of the Earth. <laughs> yeah, it's large. It's a big plasma pie headed towards Earth. As it gets closer, these charged particles will notice the magnetic field of the Earth. They will split positive and negative. They will be attracted to the poles. They will spiral down, collide with the molecules in Earth's atmosphere excite them and render them aglow, creating the northern lights or the aurora borealis. So tomorrow and over the weekend, why don't you go north and have a good look at it? He said, you mean Earth is OK? I said, Earth is fine. <laughs> they said, can you say that on the air? And I said, uh, OK. And they said, we'll send up a limo. And I said, limo on the air? And I'm like, I'm a graduate student, all right? I'm wearing my one shirt, and I got BO, and I'm not, you know. <laughs> So I said, could you send the limo to my house, OK, to my apartment, and meet me there, not at the office? So I like run home, shower, put on my one tie, my one you know, shirt, my one jacket, go to the interview, would sit in here like this, a little backdrop of books, kind of the, this, the erudite set. Anyway, so we do the interview. And that's why we record the tape at 3 in the afternoon. So I go home, call everybody. Mom, dad, sis, brother, grandma, grandpa. So I'm going to be on TV. Tune in. This is my first time on TV. So I'm home eating dinner. OK? And the interview comes on. There it is. So there it is. And at the end, I had an epiphany a revelation. You ready? Yeah. It's 1989. I had never before in my life, and I believe to this day that that was the first such occasion ever, but I had never before in my life seen an interview mm. with a black person on television for expertise that had nothing to do with being black. Uh, holding aside, of course, interviews with performers and musicians or athletes, right? I'm talking about experts. An Bro intellectual. Intellectual. Subject. I had never seen a black person. The guy didn't ask me, well, how do black people feel about this plasma <laughs> coming from the sun? <laughs> what does your community feel about this? Will it harm your skin the way it will harm ours? That's not the conversation that unfolded. I was telling him whether Earth would survive. And at that point, I realized that one of the last stereotypes that prevailed in the, among people who carry stereotypes is that so that black people are somehow dumb. There used to be the stereotype that blacks were like physically unable, right? You know, shiftless and lazy. And then Jesse Owens in the 1936 Olympics sets four world records within 45 minutes in front of Hitler, right? the Aryan race. So that kind of fixed that one, right? We got that one done. You know, no one is saying blacks don't have physical ability. That one's done, OK? So when you combine this, I wondered, maybe, if there's more of this, that's a way to undermine the sort of the, the stereotype that prevailed about who's smart and who's dumb. And think about it. The word smart is not applied to all professions, even if you are smart in that profession. No one talks about smart lawyers. They may say a brilliant lawyer. They'll talk about a creative artist. Smart is saved for scientists. It just is. It's not even really applied to medical doctors. It's a, it applies to scientists in the lab figuring stuff out that hadn't been figured out before. So if you had visible examples of this, then whatever is your next encounter with the black person trying to squeegee your windshield at the, at the red light, and 
if you're prone to saying, oh, these black people, they don't work and they're too dumb, you're gonna have to remember that I just told you that Earth is safe from the plasma that came from the sun. And so you're gonna have to reconcile this. You're gonna have to be wondering, well, maybe this guy could have been one of those. But for lack of opportunity, but for lack of institutions with foresight, okay? And Neil, at this point, you had the answer to your Rhodes Scholar. Thank you! I said to myself, I just have to be visible, or others like me, in that situation. That would have a greater force on society than anything else I could imagine. Anything else. And so to this day, I'm getting email from white people saying they wish they were as smart as I was. That was an unthinkable thing 30 years ago. That just would not have ever happened. White people wishing they were smart like black people. And so, um, I, so, so then I said to myself, it's not that the black community can't afford to have me do astrophysics. It can't afford to me to not do astrophysics. And at that point, I found myself standing outside the hole. I had climbed out just the act of observing that interview. And since then, there have been other interviews with uh, 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 intel intellectuals of minority groups that have nothing to do with their being a minority. But I think that might have been the first ever. And I'll tell you why I think it was the first. Not that I've seen every single broadcast up until that minute of every channel, but it was another five years before I saw it happen again. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it was a and you were blip. Looking for and, it. and then yeah. you're looking. Yeah. It's like you buy a new car and everybody yeah, somehow right. has your car that you're right. driving. Right. You're, you're, <laughs> but how did that happen? Well, you're now looking for it. So I was looking for it. And it went another five years. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm out of the hole. So then I said, well, let me look up my guy, see what he's doing. I can't find him anywhere on the internet. I don't know where he is. So I, I think I made the right decision. <laughs>